Thank you for watching or listening to the ASB Author Showcase, spotlighting authors from around the world. ASB Author Showcase is produced by Author School of Business, an author owned organization helping authors to fully understand the business side of being an author. If you would like to be on the show or to be a sponsor of the show, simply email us at authorschool at outlook.com. Your host for today's show is B. Allen Bourgeois. Howdy and welcome to the Author School of Business Author Showcase. Today I have with me Ernie Lee, um, who has written several books, and I'd like to welcome you, Ernie. How are you? Thank Ernie. you. I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here. I want to thank you, Alan, and, and thank the Author School of Business for this award. Very, uh, very meaningful to me, and I appreciate it very much. Well, you're more than welcome. You deserved it. Um, so let's talk about your past. Your, your man, I shouldn't say past, but your other books. Um, you started off with Aquarius, correct? Aquasaurus, yes. Aquasaurus. Aquasaurus. Um, and you won an award for that one as well. I did. Okay. Um, and then you created a secondary book. Well, let's start with these two because Search for Aquarius. Um, they're both related to the same storyline, basically. So tell us a little bit about those. Well, uh, it's about a giant, previously thought to be extinct crocodile that lived under San Antonio in the aquifer until a fracker created an earthquake and a crocodile got out. And so the first book was a group of cave explorers. They were young young people, uh, college young college students that were into action sports. They were in these adventure sports, and they did, a, a, you know, rock climbing. They did uh, cave exploring, of course. And, and I, if, if it was dangerous, they'd do it. So they, they were into all of that. Uh, the, the, the girls, the girlfriends, are rock climbers. They're, they're world-class rock climbers. And the guys in the story are, are exploring Honey Creek Cave. Honey Creek Cave is a real cave, not far from where I live here at Canyon Lake. It's one of the longest caves uh, in Texas. hasn't been totally fully explored and mapped out yet. So uh, I I knew from my earlier uh, studies that Texas was once part of a, a large inland sea, a shallow tropical sea, and we've got a lot of dinosaur tracks around here. And I had read about uh, a new uh, fossil that they had found called Carnifex carolinus. It was discovered in Carolina. He was as big as a bus. He was big enough to eat uh, a dinosaur. He was big enough to eat uh, uh, Rex. And so I thought, wouldn't that be cool if we had those here? And so uh, I went ahead and, uh, and started the storyline on it. Uh, I had to uh, I had to put him someplace where he wouldn't have been discovered yet. And so uh, one one of the things about uh, these crocodiles is they believe that they escape the extinction e event by going into caves. In fact, a lot of caves around the world have crocodiles in them. Uh, and so I said, well, we'll just put him in one of these limestone caves we got here. And he was too big to get out. They didn't know he was in there for thousands of years. And they, uh, he, uh, they don't, they don't need to mate to reproduce. Turns out, and so uh, that became part of the storyline too. So after thousands of years, that little colony is has uh, dwindled down. There wasn't much space for them anyway, uh, and we're down to a single species of Carnifex, the butcher. And so uh, the the boys run into him in the cave, they figure out what it is. And uh, at the meantime, a, a fracker is under a lot of pressure to find oil and he's, he's hit uh, a, a, a dome, a granite dome that they can't get the drill through. So he puts something down in the in the mine he shouldn't have put in there, white phosphorus, and, and uh, it kind of uh, created an earthquake. And through all that process, there was a cave in, and the boys are trapped in the cave with the crocodile, and and eventually the crocodile gets out, and the girlfriends have to come save them because they know how to climb rocks and use ropes, and so uh, it turned out to be a fun book. I really enjoyed it, and uh, and at the time I thought it was going to be the only one, but people kept asking me, 
well, what happened to the crocodile? You know, where did the crocodile? Well, the crocodile went down the river, San Antonio River, got into the Gulf of Mexico and, and started preying on shrimpers. And so the group gets back together. The government wants to wants to terminate it because it's a dangerous animal. Uh, the college that they're in wants to capture it and study it, and they want to save it. And uh, and so uh, before they want to, they want to capture it before it gets down into Mexico and mates with the local uh, indigenous crocodiles, and then you really got a mess. You got these giant crocodiles everywhere. And so, search for Aquasaurus was that that book, and uh, and it was very uh, fun to do, and it turned out to be a good story. But I don't plan on writing any more crocodile books. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it for me. It sounds like you did a lot of research for that. I did. I did a lot of research, especially around San Antonio at the first book. I don't know if you know Alan, but the sidewalks down by the river walk are not solid ground. In fact, it's hollow underneath, and they're held up by by these brackets and, and by structures underneath there that holds the sidewalk up. So in the in the ensuing uh, earthquake, uh, the, all those sidewalks collapse like they would. And uh, I brought uh, that to the attention of the city, who uh, who's since done a lot of things to try to bolster those structures and keep those sidewalks from falling in. City Council had discussed it about a year before I wrote the book, and so that's why I put it in there. I thought, hey, that's a pretty interesting angle. So uh, of all the devastation, the sidewalks along the river wall collapsing is, is uh, pretty interesting. Okay. So we've got a couple other books that you've written as well. It's called Him, a novel. And then you also have Where the Wild Rice Grows, which is a poetry book. Um, so we've got a couple minutes left. Tell us both about those. Okay, uh, Where the Wild Rice Grows, I've been, I spent 22 years in the Air Force, traveled all over the world, and and, and I started out as a songwriter, had a career in music, and then I went into the Air Force for 22 years, and I wrote poems and songs and mostly uh, stories about places I've been, people I saw all over the world. Then I moved out here to Canyon Lake and in the Hill Country and Chanaby. I, I love this part of Texas, and so... I wrote a bunch of uh, poems about the hill country and then the Tonkawa Indians that lived out here originally. And so uh, the first part of the book is about the hill country and the Tonkawa Indians, all poetry. And then the last uh, the last chapters are about places I've been, people I met, uh, people I saw and, and uh, wrote, wrote poems about. And him, the novel, what's that one about? Uh, that's about the, one of the first serial killers was in Texas in 1885, and I wrote about that. I'd read it in, uh, in Texas Monthly, and uh, there were a lot, 20, uh, 20 uh, different suspects. They never caught the person that, that did it. One of the suspects was a Malaysian sailor named Maurice, and I'm wondering what's a Malaysian sailor doing in Austin in 1885, not even close to the ocean. And so uh, as I started looking through that, I built a story around how he got there, why he was there. And then in my research, you know, the autopsy reports are still available on those murders that happened in Austin. And so I'm trying to figure out why he did it, how he did it. He, uh, he it's kind of gross. He sliced them open and pulled their entrails out and threw them over their shoulders. And then there was a point, uh, a sharp object went through their head, sometimes through the ear, all the way through. So I did some research on, on, on Malaysian and Southeast Asian uh, uh, folk tales, and they have werewolves and vampires just like we do. And if we're going to kill uh, an American or European vampire, it's a stake through the heart. But in Malaysia, it's a stake through the head. So I said, aha. There's there's my uh, there's my my uh, story, uh, what, what we call a hook, and so I put that in there, and then uh, uh, what did he use? Well, he was a sailor. He had uh, he had access to a marlin spike, and a marlin spike looks like this. This is a an actual late eighteenth century marlin spike. It is sharp on one end. It's got a butt on it. 
and you stick it up there and whack it, and it would go right through a skull real easily. So I read the uh, the autopsy reports that I could get my hands on, and, and the size exactly matches it. So I knew why he did it and how he did it. And so KUT Radio called me up and did an interview uh, with uh, with a uh, on the on air interview uh, for that, and it was carried by uh, NPR. Great. And that's great advertising for any new author and stuff. So congratulations. I was very fortunate. Yeah. Well, we are at that time. We need to wrap up our um, first segment. We're going to be back and we'll talk about Cosplay, his newest book that he won an award for. We'll be right back. Looking to take your writing career to the next level? Look no further than 100 plus questions a writer slash author should ask. With over 100 questions curated by award-winning author and speaker B. Alan Bourgeois, the founder and CEO of the Author's School of Business, this book is a must-have for any aspiring or established writer. Bourgeois, a seasoned publisher, author advocate, and educator, brings his wealth of experience to the table to help you better understand the publishing world and succeed in your career. Don't miss out on this valuable resource get an additional bonus of a one-month free subscription to the Author's School of Business valued at $12.95. Each and every one of us has a mission in life. Mine is to help people laugh through the good times and the bad. My name is Charlotte Canyon, and I am an author, a speaker, and a host on Indie Beacon Radio. If you need me to speak at an event or autograph my book, you can contact me at charlotte at charlottecanyon.com. Thank you, and have a blessed day. Hi, everybody. This is your author advocate, B. Allen Bourgeois, talking about the 2024 year of the indie authors it's going to be a great year to celebrate being an indie author or for a small press so we hope you'll come and check it out be a part of it you can get a free membership but there's also programs to help increase your marketing potential to gain more readers more followers for your books the website is indieauthors24.com and on there you can get this free copy of the book top 12 things to make the year of the indie authors great and it is full of information to help with the marketing of you and your books so that you can be a successful author. So please stop by the website at IndieAuthors24.com, get the book, sign up for the programs, and be a part of the exciting year that's coming ahead. Thanks and have a great day. Marianne Fairmont is a career consultant with 30 years experience in the national recruiting world. A multi-award winning author in multi-genres, and a speaker that gives presentations to help you succeed. Her book, Revolutionary Recruiting, made the top 20 global list of recruiting books. Find her on Amazon, your favorite bookstore, or at Fairmont.com. Are you a poet looking for an opportunity to showcase your talent and win exciting prizes? Look no further than the Author's School of Business Poetry Contest. Join a community of talented poets and get your work recognized by industry professionals. This is your chance to take your poetry career to the next level. Our contest is open to poets of all ages and backgrounds, and we welcome poems in any style or genre. So whether you're a seasoned writer or just starting out, we want to hear your voice. Visit our website to learn more about the contest rules and how to submit your work. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to showcase your poetry and win amazing prizes. Join the Author's School of Business Poetry Contest and become a part of a community that celebrates the beauty and power of poetry. Welcome back to the ASB Author Showcase with your host, B. Alan Bourgeois. And welcome back to the Author School of Business Authors Showcase. And I have with me Ernest Lee, who we now, we've in the last segment, talked about his first books. Now we're going to talk about his newest book called Cosplay, um, a Comic Con killer. Um, did I get that right? Yes, it's Cosplay, the Comic Con killer. Right. And uh, very proud of it. It came out 
a lot better than I thought it would. The the story behind that is we coming. I go to a lot of comic cons to sell. They like that crocodile book at comic cons for some reason, and the kids just love it. And so we're coming back, and the wife says, "Why don't you write a book about comic con?" Well, you know, I don't write that way, but then she says, "Well, you know, you got a built-in audience there." So I thought, "Well, what if there was a, a serial killer?" that went around to all of the Comic-Cons all over the U.S. and tracked the same character at every Comic-Con. The police wouldn't be able to figure it out. First, he's in costume. Uh, two, they don't know a whole lot about gaming. and They don't know about Comic-Con and that, and that culture. And so I invented a rookie cop, and uh, she's, she made detective quicker than anybody in the history of the San Antonio Police Department and becomes a detective. And uh, they find, a, of course, they find a body in a dumpster behind the, the convention center after Comic-Con. She recognizes the costume and knows that it's tied to Comic-Con somehow. And it's uh, she's dressed as a character named Evie Fry. And so with the bosses, they don't want to hear about this. They, they won't stick to the facts, just the facts and nothing but the facts. And they don't want to hear about games <laughs> In Comic Con, so she has to kind of go out on a limb on her own and, and try to track it down, and and she uh, she does that. And as you can see on the cover, I guess you can see the cover here. He is chasing her through the warehouse. There she she finds him, and uh, and it, and it wasn't a pleasant uh, activity, but they did catch him, and and uh, the book ended well. And so we've had a lot of fun with it too. So there's two questions related to this. First off, your female characters, um, Salima. Um, why did you choose her and what were you trying to educate people about as far as being a female detective? Well, you know, there there's still uh, a lot of bureaucracy, uh, even even for male cops coming up, especially for females. They always had to had to prove themselves better than than, uh, than, than the others. And, and so what I wanted to say here was that it took a young person to unravel this mystery and that the old the old folks on the on the police force can learn from these new folks if they're if they're not uh, closed minded about it because they they have a different world, a different uh, experience, a different uh, reference line that that might play into some some good opportunities for solving crimes. And I named her Selma Cibolo, which is kind of funny. It's kind of an inside joke because Selma and Cibolo are two little small bedroom communities here off of San Antonio. So only folks that come from San Antonio will get the joke. But uh, she turned out to be a very strong character and, uh, and very effective and and uh, I don't know if there'll be any more Selma Cibolo detective books, but uh, it's possible. In fact, I thought about putting her in another book on trafficking, uh, sex trafficking. And so I'm trying to figure out how that all fits together. But, but yeah, there's a lot of research. I had to research these games. I had to research, uh, uh, you know, the, the Comic-Con culture and, and figure out a scenario as to why this guy would go around and attack the same character in every comic con. And so that brings story. and that so, brings up the second question in reference to why did you choose um, to use the character that's from Assassination Creed Syndicate's um, game, uh, Evie Fry? Why did you choose her for the character that's being killed in all of these different ones? Uh, it just fascinated me. Uh, Evie Fry uh, had a brother uh, in the game, Assassin's uh, Creed. And so I wrote it as Assassin's Revenge uh, in, in the book to try to avoid, uh, you know, copyright infringement. But the characters uh, are fair game. They're, they're open game as far as writing what they call fan fiction about them. And so I took some of the scenarios uh, and put uh, put him in that scenario. He, of course, being a serial killer, is not uh, not sane. He he has fantasies, and he's got lost in the game, and he's confused, and he thinks the game is 
his real life and his real life is is uh, not the game is the game so he's kind of confused mixed up and and he feels like he has has to take some revenge against Evie Fry who they say killed a character uh, named Spring Hill Jack and Spring Hill Jack is tied to Batman as his grandfather and so it, it all it all kind of works together in some of these game scenarios. Uh, I want to get people interested in the game. I want people to get interested in the storyline and uh, especially the book. And so uh, hopefully we've accomplished all three there. So I'm curious, did you send a copy of the book to the creators of the game? No, I didn't. Uh, I don't know how to get in touch with them for one thing. And, uh, you know, I just haven't really had time because it's only been out a year and uh, I, uh, I was, uh, I've been trying to go around and peddle the book in different places. And so uh, just haven't really had taken the time to do that because I started the new novel and, and I'm writing on that. It's taken quite a bit of time to do a lot of research on it as well. So that brings up the, the next question. You said previously that you do go to a lot of Comic Cons and that's where the idea came from. So how is the reception at these events for the book? Oh, every everywhere I go, uh, Comic Cons it sells out. I'll take a case of books down there and come back with an empty box. So they they've really really, really been accept open to it and have been reading it and they and they still like the crocodile books too. So so it's been very uh, very uh, uh, rewarding to go to those Comic Cons because those those folks are so open and so ready to read. They they are readers and and uh, and actors and. And so they're really into it, and, uh, and it's very uh, refreshing to go down there and uh, find so many people that are interested in your work. Good. Um, you mentioned that you started a new book, so tell us a little bit about this. Well, I, uh, I, I previously my novels had been suspense thrillers. And I decided, well, I'm going to try a different genre. I'm going to write a drama, and so I've been toying around with an idea for at least 30 years. Uh, I come from South Texas, Bryan College Station, and many of you may know where that's at. And just south of there's a little a little town called Navasota. And it's on the Navasota River, where the Navasota River joins the Brazos. Having grown up around the Brazos, there's a lot of cotton down there and a lot of agriculture. And so uh, I, I had originally had this idea of a small town in Texas, Navasota, uh, where everybody knows everybody else's business. And just like the town I grew up in, Brian. And so uh, I have these two brothers that haven't spoken to each other in 50 years. And like most small towns, everybody in town has an opinion as to what happened and, and why it's like that. And they're all wrong. And so the story is unfolding as it as it exposes the reasons for their estrangement, and now why all of a sudden they're getting back together, and uh, and uh, and going back out to the to the uh, to the ranch. And the thing is, it was it's a cotton farm started out a plantation, and I had to research a lot about cotton, cotton crops, cotton growing. I grew up around cotton all my life, but I knew very little about how it's harvested and, and marketed. And so I'll put a lot of that in there so people will, will learn a little bit about the cotton business. Great. We are at that point. I need to take another break for our sponsors, but we'll be right back. The 2024 Year of the Indie Authors is a year-long celebration of self-published writers who have made a significant impact on the literary world. Independent authors are writers who don't rely on traditional publishing houses, but instead take control of every aspect of their book, from writing to marketing and distribution. Self-publishing has opened doors for writers to reach a global audience and retain creative control over their work. As an indie author, you can benefit from complete control over your book, including content, cover design, pricing, and distribution. You also retain all the rights to your work, allowing for greater royalties in the long term. Indie authors write across all genres providing readers with a diverse selection of books at affordable prices. 
The 2024 year of the indie authors is a time to celebrate the hard work and dedication of self-published writers. It's an opportunity to discover new authors and stories, support artistic freedom, and encourage writers to take creative risks. For authors, it's a chance to showcase their work, gain recognition, and network with other indie authors. Our mission is to celebrate and recognize the contribution of independent authors to the literary world during the 2024 year of the indie authors. We value appreciation, recognition, and inclusivity, and offer various initiatives such as events, promotions, and networking opportunities. We provide a platform for indie authors to showcase their work and connect with other writers while promoting the affordability and accessibility of self-published books. Join us in creating a supportive and inclusive community that fosters creativity and recognition for indie authors. The garden was still there, full of vegetables and flowers, and a little lone rabbit sat nibbling on a pea plant. Cody picked, chopped, and cooked some cabbage, chop, 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 and Coda picked two carrots and cut them into pieces. I'm so happy to have a new friend. The end. Wasn't that fun? Yeah! <laughs> As an author, it's important to find an organization that can provide the resources and support you need to succeed in the publishing industry. The Authors School of Business (ASB) is a well-respected organization that has been helping authors learn how to market and sell themselves and their books since 2011. Here are a few reasons why you should consider joining ASB instead of another organization. 1. Expertise and experience. 2. Comprehensive education. 3. Customized learning options. 4. Community and networking. 5. Cost-effective and flexible membership options. ASB is an excellent choice for authors who want to succeed in the publishing industry. By joining ASB, you can benefit from the organization's expertise and experience, receive comprehensive education, customize your learning experience, connect with a supportive community, and enjoy flexible and cost-effective membership options. Welcome back to the ASB Author Showcase with your host, B. Allen Bourgeois. And welcome back to the ASB's Author Showcase. I'm your host, B. Allen Bourgeois, and we have had a um, conversation with Ernie Lee, Ernest Lee. And in the last segment, you were talking about your newest book. Do you have a title, a working title for it? Yes, it's going to be called Mary Go Round the Dewdrop. Okay. And Do you have the reason? <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a portion of the book that explains that. And, uh, so don't give it away. Don't give the story away. <laughs> so it's uh it's going to be called Merry Go Round the Dewdrop, and mm -hmm. it sounds kind of funny, but it's also easy to remember because it's so unusual. That it is. Do you have a time frame when you hope to have it published? Uh, I hope to have it this winter. Great. And out of curiosity, for those who are enjoying your books and stuff like that, um, do you have a website where other people can discover you? I do. It's called uh, aimhighbooks.com. It's www.aim-hibooks.com. And uh, books are available there. And synopsis, short sample chapters, and an opportunity to buy the book. Great. And I'll, I'll on... Also you on your website, I'm sorry. Also on your website, do you have a calendar um, so they can see where you're going to be at? No, uh, I don't. Uh, I I put that on my Facebook page when I get scheduled to go somewhere. Uh, but on the website, you can hear my music. As I mentioned, I would start out an entertainer, and, and I've got some songs out there that uh, that you can listen to. You can you can go read some of the poems and some of the poetry. And uh, there's just quite a quite a you can explore around there and, and look at all that stuff. Great. And um, other than Facebook, do you have any other social media? Uh, no, I don't. I okay. I do have uh, uh, Twitter, but I never really learned how to utilize it properly enough to to get any attention on it. I got five or six hundred followers, but 
I put I advertise a book out there sometimes and and tell them where to go get it. And I've never had a hit off of Twitter yet, so well, I'm probably not doing it right. That's all right. Twitter's not that strong anymore, so you never know if it's going to be around much longer. Um, in reference to your writing, you've got a wide variety of stuff that you've written. Do you have any words of encouragement for somebody who's considering writing? I do. Uh, in fact, we have a little writers group here in New Braunfels called New Braunfels Creative Writers. And so my advice would be uh, to find some of those local groups that's in your area and, and participate. Go. It's a, it's a place where you can be comfortable. You can share your work without without worry and without worry of being criticized. You'll get some uh, creative and constructive criticism, which is always good. And uh, and just keep writing. Uh, you know, a writer writes, you know, that's, that's even if nobody's going to read it, a writer will continue to write. And that's pretty much how I define a writer is someone that has these stories to tell and you put them down on paper in a compelling way that that uh, makes sense. And you've done a great job at that, winning several awards. So congratulations. Thank you. We are unfortunately at the end of the um, show. I want to thank you very much, Ernie, for being with us, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you, thank you for watching or listening to the ASB Author Showcase, spotlighting authors from around the world. ASB Author Showcase is produced by Author School of Business, an author-owned organization helping authors to fully understand the business side of being an author. If you would like to be on the show or to be a sponsor of the show, simply email us at authorschool at outlook.com. Thank you to Happy Follows for creating the music, Frolic of Words, for the ASB Author Showcase. You can find his music on all major platforms.